Hello, Black Healing Matters family. Danielle here at the Black Healing Matters podcast, where we offer you ideas to hopefully move you one step closer to your healing. Happy Tuesday to you. And on this Know Thy History Tuesday, we are continuing and a topic that I picked up while I was in New York several weeks ago at the Schomburg Library in Harlem, in New York, <laughs> because I mentioned. And so I asked last week, put this question out to you, Black Healing Matters family, what do you know about the Black Panthers? And by the Black Panthers, I don't mean the movie. I mean the political party. Okay, what do you know about them? <clears throat> and I ask you to call in and tell me a few things. Number one, how old are you? Okay, just to give us an idea of what era you grew up in and, and also kind of where you grew up. In addition, I ask, what do you know? Again, what, what were you kind of, you know, what was your uh, acquaintance, if you will? What was the, what information did you know offhand about the Black Panthers? Did you have a certain perception of them? Um, you know, and, and this is before, you know, doing any kind of in-depth study on your own. And I'm really thankful that I was able to receive some great call-ins. And today we're going to hear from two of our loyal listeners. And the reason I ask this question is because I really want to highlight the difference in understanding of these two, actually both of them are men, two gentlemen. <clears throat> and I think it has a lot to do with their, of course, their age difference, but also where they grew up and kind of the era in general. Okay. And so <clears throat> the first one, let's hear, we're going to hear from is Mr. D. Wynn from the Legacy Podcast. Here we go. Danielle, you're being so unfair. It's not enough time on these messages. The Black Panther Party. Ah, the movement against uh, racist power structure. Uh, Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, or Starkly Carmichael. Uh, the carrying of the weapons in the Capitol. Uh, 1966, uh, there's a, the 10-point program. 1967 riots. Detroit, New Newark, during their free sex and love and drugs uh was blossoming, whatever. Um, you know, the battle with police, uh, with Hugh P. Newton since the death, um, Eldridge, Eldridge and Hutton's gun standoff, uh, the 17 year old boy who got shot up that nobody really talks about anymore, um, Free Huey, uh, Eldridge against Reagan. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. I don't have enough time on this podcast. We got to do a podcast about this. I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's impressive. Obviously, he knows quite a bit about the Black Panthers. And as I mentioned before, I think this has a lot to do with the era that he grew up in. And just that general time, the Black Panthers were everywhere and everybody kind of knew about them. And the reason I, again, I ask people to call in and talk about this is because you will see that there is a vast difference in the knowledge of people born in different different areas different eras of time even in our own communities and so someone born in my mother's generation who my mother was born in 1957 she knew a lot about the black panthers however what i know about the black panthers i did not learn from my family and that is really the importance of what i'm what i'm trying to explain here today is that it is so important that we actually become the gatekeepers of our history because unfortunately, history is told by the victors. And in this case, obviously, the Black Panthers were not the victors. And so it's up to us to be able to counter that narrative with the truth. Okay. All right. So next up, we're going to hear from someone born a lot later <laughs> and his perspective and his knowledge growing up of what the Black Panthers represented. And I'd like to, you to see the contrast in their understanding 
and perception of the Black Panther Party. Okay, I was born in 1983 and I reside in Minnesota and this is Dewan and Oli of the Fried Oreo. Anyhow, my initial impressions and what I was told about uh, the Black Panther Party growing up was that they were militant. That's I would hear that a lot, very militant bunch. Um, but as I began to study and find out uh, things myself, I found out that they actually were about the black community and protecting it from the police corruption, which is still rampant in uh, Los An or, or L.A. And, Cal and Oakland and stuff like that. But um, anyhow, in the WIC program and things of that nature and. What a shame it was that uh, our government at the time wanted to shut it down. And the Crips actually were initially started out to be a variation of Black Panthers, but they ended up being uh, just gangbangers. Thank you for this. Thank you so much for that call in, the one and only from the fried Oreo, because you know what? It illustrates so clearly, as you mentioned, many of us born in the 80s, now in our 30s, only knew the Black Panthers as this kind of militant group that was like violent. And unless you actually do some research, and I mean like online and reading books, then you wouldn't know the difference. And obviously there are a lot of us who have never actually done the research. So kudos to you, the one and only, because I know that you, you know, this is, this is, you're genuinely interested in this topic, but there's so many who just don't, you know, who don't study, who don't learn. And therefore they're walking around with these misconceptions about what the Black Panthers actually did and stood for. And the reason I talk about the Black Panthers and the reason I want to really illustrate this point is because Dewan had only mentioned that he was born, I believe, in 1983. And that's around the same time when the Black Panther Party actually dissolved. It was disbanded officially. It was, I believe, 1982 or 83. And so it's it's really interesting how quickly the narrative was changed someone born in the year that the, the party disbanded has a comp was is is given a perception of this group that was so influential and so important to american politics but their legacy is completely warped in many ways and so thank you so much to both of you d win and the one and only from the fried Oreo. I appreciate your call-ins because it really illustrates the point and drives home the fact that we as black people, especially must, must, must do a better job of passing on our own history. Um, being the, uh, the actual recorders of our own history which starts with these kind of conversations. So I thank you, listener, for actually listening to this and hopefully you gain some insight. So I'm not gonna leave you here because I'm gonna give you uh, something that I found recently. So if you don't know much about the Black Panther Party, uh, the reason I talk about them is because it's not like they you know, were just this militant group as the one and only alluded to. They did real stuff real stuff that actually has a huge effect on politics and the world we live in to this day. One of the things that the Black Panther Party was really big on is medical care. Now, as you know, <laughs> nationalized medical care in the US is a hot topic, but the Black Panthers really did believe that this was a fundamental human right. And of course, um, you know, that is, that was part of their, their agenda is to provide these fundamental human rights to black people because they realized that the government had failed them. So I found an amazing video that outlines the particular importance that the black Panthers held in the field of medicine and some of the advancements that they made. We're talking about a political party made 
not too long ago and how those those medical advancements affect us to this day okay i hope that this will help to correct the narrative and hopefully shed light on a much brighter legacy that the black panther party actually did leave and add to the counter narrative that the u.s government has been putting out for a long time that these were just basically street thugs. That's That was not the case. So stay tuned. This video, it is a little bit long. I think it's about 12 minutes. If you'd like to watch it, it's great. Um, click the, the link in the show notes and you can watch it on YouTube. And on that note, Black Healing Matters family, I love you. Please connect with us. Send me an email, a call in anything okay <laughs> youtube soundcloud of course facebook as well as here on anchor all available for you please do connect with me let me know what you thought of this information and if you know anything else about the black panther party would love to hear from you as well as always stay blessed again stay tuned black killing matters <music> Guns, berets, and leather jackets may be the images you associate most with the Black Panther Party. But what you may not know is how the political group shifted healthcare in the U.S. to be more community-based. Our government was not going to provide health care, so we were going to provide health care for the people. The Black Panthers opened three medical facilities, created the very first nationwide screening program for sickle cell anemia, a blood disorder, and they even help establish a form of acupuncture that's still in use today. We spend a lot more time serving the people than we did protesting or uh, defending ourselves from the police. So why isn't the Black Panthers healthcare activism more widely known? Well, it may be by design. History is written by the victors. The Black Panthers are not writing the history of the Black Panther Party. Hey fam, I'm Imayan, and this Sunday on AJ Plus, we're exploring the Black Panther Party's history, healthcare legacy, and how a covert government program tried to bury it all. <music> to understand what prompted the Black Panthers' foray into healthcare, you first have to understand why it came into existence. Here's how co-founder Huey P. Newton explained the group. We are bound to transform society and uh, erect a system where uh, people will receive justice. The Panthers formed on the heels of the Civil Rights Movement, a time when the push for racial equality and equity divided the U.S. 1965 was a pivotal year that helped spark the Panthers' creation, according to former Black Panther Billy Jennings. We had the murder of Malcolm X in February. Also, you had the... Uh, the signing of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and also you had the Watts Riot happening in August of 1965, along with the Selma March in 1965. Then, in the fall of 1966, a white police officer ran down and killed an unarmed teenager in a historically black neighborhood in San Francisco. It was a breaking point. The community rioted. The governor declared a state of emergency, and the next day, National Guard soldiers marched with bayonets through the streets. This was the fertile ground in America's landscape that prompted Newton and Bobby Seale to found the Black Panthers Party for Self-Defense in October 1966. The Black Panthers' initial mission was to police the police. Panthers followed patrol vehicles ready to defend their communities with force if they felt the need arose. This is the part of their legacy that the world remembers. But the physical self-defense was a fraction of the Panthers' objectives. As their movement grew, so did their vision. Dr. Tolbert Small was a physician to the Black Panthers, though he wasn't a party member. They were not just people in black jackets carrying guns. They were interested in actually doing something for the community. The Black Panthers focused more on what they call survival programs, things like food assistance, free education, free legal aid. And one of their top priorities was free community health care. Most of our civilized countries will provide these services for the people. The Panthers realized that we didn't have a civilized country. We were not providing these services for the people. As a young doctor, Small treated political activists like Angela Davis and George Jackson in prison. And when Bobby Seale issued a directive for all chapters to establish free health clinics in 1970, 
the Black Panther Party turned to Dr. Small to help build the program. I had all the pharmaceutical companies donating medicines to the George Jackson Free Clinic. I had doctors volunteering, nurses volunteering, med techs volunteering. Their Sheba Haven, who was a member of the Black Panther Party, says the Black Panthers' approach to health care was radical. I think that they had a great impact on medicine in general because they were progressive, not just in the idea that health care is a right, but in the way that health care is delivered. The Black Panther Party interceded in places where the U.S. government was seemingly absent, like its nationwide screening program for sickle cell disease. It was a first. The government was not prioritizing sickle cell anemia for the same reason that Jackie Robinson had to be the first baseball, black baseball player in 1948, for the same reason that the black troops were segregated during World War II. There was racism in this country. Sickle cell anemia was a disease that affected uh, mostly black folks. Sickle cell is the single most common genetic disease in the United States, and the vast majority of patients are African American. It's painful and deadly, and in 1970, the country only allocated less than $100,000 in funding. I spent $7.8 million on muscular dystrophy, $1.6 million on cystic fibrosis, $8 million to get a man on the moon. And obviously, sickle cell anemia was not a priority. Then an intriguing thing happened in 1972. John Lennon invited Black Panther members and collaborators to appear on one of the most popular talk shows of the day, The Mike Douglas Show. And they seized the platform to address the problem of sickle cell disease. We've tested 30,000 people in sickle cell, for sickle cell anemia. I think we've tested more than anybody in the country. And just like that, sickle cell became part of the national conversation. The Panthers used their medical infrastructure to run tests for sickle cell in cities all over the country. So it is objectively true that one of the defining public health initiatives of the early 1970s wasn't launched by the U.S. government, but by an organized group of socialist advocates. The initiative gained so much momentum that President Nixon signed legislation to aid research on finding a cure for the disease. By this point, the Black Panthers had become a major cultural force operating on the international stage. Their philosophy shared common ground with Maoists in China. And as China began to normalize relations with the U.S., they invited Huey P. Newton to visit months before receiving President Nixon. And that visit was a major reason why acupuncture entered the American mainstream. Acupuncture existed in the Chinese community already, but the Chinese community in America was, was more insular and more like an enclave. Right, we, we introduced it to the rest of the world. The year after Newton visited China, he sent a delegation of 19 people to the country, including Dr. Small. When they came back from 1972, we started uh, talking about acupuncture more. And we had people practicing acupuncture on both coasts. The Black Panthers also helped run the first health clinic to implement five-point ear acupuncture. That protocol is still used today to treat conditions like drug addiction and post-traumatic stress. So the group had a major influence on healthcare initiatives in the U.S. Why then does it seem like that narrative has been hidden? Why are the Panthers so often associated with this rather than this? It's partly because of controversial FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and a little program you may have heard of before, COINTELPRO. Well, one of the things that J. Edgar Hoover always talked about was you, black people being unified, a, a messiah coming to unify black people, which he was terrified of because he was a racist. COINTELPRO, or Counterintelligence Program, was a propaganda and surveillance operation that the FBI used to target activists, political groups, and minorities. COINTELPRO was basically designed to destroy members of the movement that they felt was a threat to the American government and the American way of life. COINTELPRO's goal was to discredit leaders and divide movements, or as the FBI put it at the time, to pinpoint potential troublemakers and neutralize them. The power structure did not want to show uh, the survival programs of the Panthers. They wanted to paint them as people who were committing crimes and violence. Of the 290 operations carried out by COINTELPRO, the Panthers were targets of 245. For those of you that enjoy math, that's more than 84%. Hoover personally instructed 14 different FBI field offices to submit imaginative and hard-hitting counterintelligence measures aimed at crippling the Panthers. They sent death threats, offensive cartoons, and forged letters to different members in an attempt to disrupt and divide the group. 
Perhaps the most insidious part about COINTELPRO was how effective it was in controlling the narrative around the party. What the FBI and the government wanted to push that the Black Panther Party was a black and angry group and that we were anti-white. So if you want to paint someone as a devil, you're not going to paint them as providing health care, providing free food, taking care of elderly people at the hospital, providing a free ambulance service like we did in North Carolina. And in a way, it worked. Years of police raids, misinformation, incarceration, and killings not only reduced membership, it left the organization financially crippled and ultimately unable to carry out its social programs. The Black Panther Party was officially disbanded in 1982. Today, many of the same structural inequities that the Black Panthers fought against continue, including access to health care. That's resulted in some devastating statistics for African Americans. In 2017, the American Heart Association said that African Americans have the worst cardiovascular health and more deaths from heart disease than any other group. They also have higher rates of HIV, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. A 2007 study shows that African Americans are much less likely to trust physicians and the overall health care system. You'll see that the statistics for black folks is vastly inferior to the statistics for white folks. And uh, the Panthers recognize that there's racism in health care, which is why they got involved in trying to provide health care for the community. But the Black Panther Party's legacy lives on. Many Panthers and volunteers with the party have gone on to work long careers in public health and medicine. Even the New York Health Commissioner, Mary Bassett, spent her early career volunteering in the Black Panthers Free Clinic. The legacy of the Black Panther Party would never be forgotten because people, those things are embedded within people's uh, families. Shortly before he was killed by police in 1969, Black Panther Fred Hampton said this. But you can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail a revolution. Right. And that revolution always included a demand for health care as a basic human right. Hey fam, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and follow. And let us know in the comments if you knew anything about the Black Panther's health care legacy, if you feel like there are any solutions they brought back then which could work today, and tell us also what you want to see us do next. We'll see you next Sunday. The podcast you just heard was recorded with Anchor. If you want to make your own, download the Android or iOS app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast. That's anchor.fm slash podcast.